Hello, everybody, and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope doing well, and today I'll be doing a review of the 4K edition of A Quiet Place Part 2. So first off, I want to shout out Paramount for sending me this copy early in order to review it, to go over uh, the 4K transfer, to go over the special features that are included on the Blu-ray edition, and also, of course, to cover some of the other uh, releases and ways that this film will be released in the coming days. Officially, this film gets released on physical media on July 27th and is available for pre-order, and you can already get it on digital. So, let me go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and first off say that this is a very good transfer. Obviously, when you talk about movies that are mostly shot on film, as something I learned from the special features of this film, most of it was shot using actual film, and it was only until they actually did uh, any of the scenes near the water uh, at the docks, essentially, where they actually switched over to a digital form, just because of having a lot more limited space and dealing with a lot darker, as far as the actual tones, darker environment as well, that it was going to be better for them uh, in that environment, especially with the limited space, to use a, a digital platform as such. And so I thought it was interesting to find that out about it. But because a lot of it is indeed from actual film negative, you do have a very good transfer in 4K. The colors really look really good. And also you have really great dynamic range, as you typically find with a lot of these 4K films. Uh, one of the things that I know that it's been talked about by a few other people who have covered this movie, as far as you know, the detail of the actual film itself and what it looks like, was that sometimes there were moments where it looked a little bit soft. You know, for me, I've never Never really been that much of a visual snob in that way. All I know is that it all looks really, really good, and especially nowadays when you compare this to what we used to have on on DVD, where you just had such low quality. It's really great to have these, you know, Blu-ray and 4K transfers where you really start to get exactly what the vision of the filmmaker is and also very very close to what you would find in an actual uh, in an actual theater and especially now with the new sound systems that people can have in their own homes you can even have sound very similar this does come with a uh, 5.1 track and also with a 7.1 track if you're able to use that I do not have access to be able to utilize the 7.1 track yet but it is indeed available there for anyone that actually is interested in it. Um, just going based off of the disc, it is, again, four times resolution of full HD, HDR high dynamic range for greater color and greater dynamic range. This also comes with a digital copy as well, and so therefore, if you have a Blu-ray player, a 4K player, or just no player at all, but you have a TV, you have pretty much everything covered within this actual release. With the Blu-ray disc, you actually do get a lot of special features, so you get a lot, uh, you, basically, you get four different um, uh segments that they give you on the actual disc. Uh, a couple of them are actually really, really interesting. There's one which is actually called here um, uh, I'm trying to find the actual name of it. Yeah, the director's diaries with John Krasinski. So it's about a 10, 11 minute clip, and it's going into all the different places where they shot some of their big sequences. And it actually is just John Krasinski explaining uh, the mindset of why they were in this certain town or why they were using something specifically for uh, you know for a scenery purpose. And one of the really cool things that was kind of revealed through all of the shorts together was just how much John Krasinski wanted to use practical effects. As as much as he could. In fact, they even said only about five shots used any blue wall, like not even blue screen, just blue wall inserts at all. Everything else you see in the movie is on location using actual practical effects. And of course, you have the monsters that are going to be CG. But other than that, uh, the vast majority of all the sequences are on location in the actual place where they are. And anytime that the monsters are interacting with any of the things with a car being flipped over or with just, you know, giant barrels being blowed to the side, all of those are, are real and all of those are time to go off. And it was just really interesting to see the dynamic of, of how they were able to do that and how they were able to really hone in on focusing on that um on that use of practical effects. And one of the things that, of course, I really appreciated from John Krasinski is how he says, and this is a true statement, and I wish more filmmakers thought this way, is if you use practical effects, it's just going to look more real. If you put the the actors in an environment where everything around them is real going on at that time, it's going to give a better performance. It's going to be more authentic, and it's going to look better on film. And that is completely true. And that's why I, I like and thoroughly enjoy films like A Quiet Place 1 and 2 because they do utilize 
the sets, they do utilize the actual on location spots too, where it's not all just done on a sound stage. It's not just all CGI with, you know, uh, behind the scenes walls. It's not like Disney where every single film they do is the vast majority CGI, blue screen, green screen, or like they did with the Mandalorian. It's just all a projection behind the people. And it's not really immersive because you're not actually experiencing the location itself. And so I really appreciated the diaries where he goes into kind of the mindset of that shot, and there's other uh, segments in here where they talk about uh, the role that, uh, you know, uh, Mil- I always forget the, the, the young actress's name, uh, Millicent, she goes by Millie uh, Simmons, who is the, the girl who is in real life deaf, and the character that she plays, you know, playing a deaf character, and how she really takes on this almost leading performance, but also how she's not just this all-powerful warrior princess, and that's something else I really like that John Christine talks about, saying that she does kind of convey this warrior princess mentality, but what she learns is when she goes out into the wild, that she can't just do everything on her own, even though she wants to be. She wants to be just like her dad. She looked up to her dad in the first film, and now she's trying to fill in the shoes of her father in the second film, and so you really do get that dynamic of her trying to be more than what she she can and, and realize that she can't do it on her own. And that's something that I always really appreciate is when characters aren't just perfect, right? Characters aren't just better than what they should be, uh, but instead are more realistic, grounded in reality, actually need to be saved. Don't just save pe- other people all the time, but even themselves need to be saved uh, from time to time as well. And so I really did like that dynamic. And I like how John Krasinski, especially in the vision he had for the movie, had that as a part of the story and and was able to implement that as such. And there's a couple other things. Uh, probably the other segment we're talking about is that there's another 10 minute se- sequence where they go into uh, the actual visual effects and the sound design of the movie. So as I said, they're able to focus on just how many practical effects are used in this film and also how they crafted the monsters and how it's not just, hey, let's make a scary monster. It's no, let's make this monster work within this world and it, it be practical. So the way that they designed the head, the way they designed the flaps with the way that the, the flaps moved on the monster's head all corresponded with stuff that was actually realistic within the world that was being built. And I, I really appreciated that they weren't just trying to make a cool looking monster to sell toys or merchandise. It was, no, we, we want to make a monster that's going to fit into this universe and it's going to make sense within this universe as well. And so I really appreciated the way they went into detail about that. And of course, the sound design for the movie and how they actually utilized dead silence from time to time in the film and how much fun they had in, in playing with silence and also at the same time having other scenes where there's a lot of noise and just working with sound in a way that, that you typically wouldn't find in a lot of films. So again, I think that the special features on this are actually pretty good. And the film itself, as I've mentioned, I've already done a full review of the movie. So if you want to hear my thoughts on that, uh, check one of the eyes above my head or check one of the associated videos and you'll find my full review of the film. But I ended up giving this film overall an A- minus because even though I appreciate and like the first film more than this one, I still think this is a really good film. I think that this works in the universe. Really excited to see what else they can do in this universe. I suspect that we'll probably get a third film coming out. But also something that John Krasinski pointed out was that he did not intend that first film to start a franchise. He he did it as a love letter to his kids. And one of the most powerful things he mentions is how the first one's a love letter to his kids about, you know, how parents, you know, are there to care for their kids. Whereas this film is all about, but what happens when those kids need to start growing up? What happens when the parents can't be there all all the time for their kids. And I just like that dynamic. And I like how Krasinski very clearly focuses on this concept of family and also family values as well. It's very rare, I think, in modern Hollywood to have uh, not just directors, but also writers, since he wrote this story too, to really have that kind of dynamic. And it really, I think, showcases in the story. So even if you don't like uh, Emily Blunt or some other thing about this movie in general, uh, as far as maybe the the logic, like some people I think have some issues with some of the logic they use, I really do think that when you start to dig d- deeper into this film, and the world that was built, that it ends up being a lot better than that. So let me go now and talk about some of uh, the other things going on before I do, just a little (laughs) self-promotion here. So if you do want to support the channel, I'm going to actually have a link at the top of the description where basically it just puts all of my links together in one location. So hopefully this will in the future allow me to have my descriptions be a little less messy. It'll have just one link where you can find access to all of the different links if you want to support the channel. Um, but anyway, that that's going to be something new that I'm going to be rolling out over the next few videos. But A Quiet Place Part 2, again, just to go over a few things about it, this film has been a big success. Again, $286 million worldwide, 
based off of a 55 to 61 million dollar budget uh, compared to the 17 million dollar budget of the first film it's very impressive that even though they were able to spend more than twice as much on this film you can tell that they used the money um, as, as best as they could meaning that all of the money went into the film you could tell that the creatures looked better they had more use of the creatures and so obviously that insinuates spending more money all of the sets that they use all of the on location stuff they use the use of practical effects all of the money that extra money that went into this film compared to the first one you can tell really went into it which is really great to see if you want to buy this this is of course available via a lot of platforms right now uh, most people are probably going to be buying it through amazon so again it's going to be available july 27th for around 27.96 if you want the 4k edition that comes with the 4k blu-ray and digital you can also get the blu-ray for 22.96 right now you can get the digital for 20 dollars dvd for 22.99 for me it's never made sense just to get a digital copy of a movie because if you get the blu-ray or 4k just for a few dollars more than what they're going to charge for the digital you get the actual physical disc which no one can take away from you you get a lot higher quality with it there's no compression but the biggest thing obviously is that they can't just decide to take it off of a platform one thing i really want to talk about though is that of course there is going to be a special uh, steelbook edition from best buy and i've actually already pre-ordered mine this is actually before i knew that paramount was going to be sending me this copy and so this will be used in a giveaway uh, once this film actually does go live so be on the lookout for a giveaway for that uh, probably for my uh, Patreon subscribe star and locals people, I'll do that giveaway. But this is also going to be available on the 27th as well. It'll be $35. So for this one, you get the Steelbook Edition. And again, I think the artwork looks pretty awesome. Uh, I like how they use the red and the white. I think that those colors really work well together, especially. Uh, but having the 4K disc, having the Blu-ray disc, and this will come with a digital copy code as well. Again, just it's always great having that level of just uh, e ease of use, like different variations of of the film and you know, anyone can, can you know, basically there's going to be something that anyone can use. And it's just, again, a really great collector's item. I would say the first one had a really cool steel book as well with, you know, scratches on the front, but the same black and red uh, use of white too uh, of the image. And so it's cool to see this one keeping in continuity because it'll look really good next to the other steel book edition of the first film. But again, these will be available for everyone to get. Um, over uh, on Best Buy, again, on July 27th. So anyway, what are your thoughts about uh, this this movie? Are you planning to pick up your copy? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like this video, smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey. It really does mean a lot. Also, check out that link at the top of the video description. That way you can find out different ways to follow me and support the channel. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless. And now for a huge shout out to all of my July Patreon and Subscribestar members. Andrew Hoyle, Biffer de Hobbit, Brian P, Dion, Don Bruno de la Mancha, Father Christopher Miller, hail to you father, Father Damien Cook, Garrett Searles, Harold Francis, Inflamed Wood, It's a Trap Productions, Jason Clark, Jacob Juice, Jeffrey Toon, Jonathan Carney, Laura, the Modern Major General's Story, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mr. Peabody and his evil twin with the beautiful hair, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Riff Magos, Rosetta Allen, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, Tina B, and Tina Bojan. Thank you all very much for supporting me over on Patreon, and also to my Subscribestar members, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, John B, Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss slash the new number two, J. Ra the Beer Guru, and ZK Man. And I also want to make sure to shout out my Locals members. I am now available over at Locals.com. And I've got two monthly supporters over there. The first of my local supporters is Goblin Squatch. Shout out to you, good sir. And also, I now have a second supporter over on Locals.com. And that is Robert Barnes. Shout out to both of you very much. Thank you very much for supporting me on that new platform at the Keeper of the Bifrost level. If you want to find out more information about that, go check out my Locals uh, page. You can find the link in the description. And it tells you everything that you would get in that Keeper of the Bifrost level, which is right now the only level available on that platform. And I also want to make sure to shout out any new Patreon members. And for right now, I want to shout out Mondo Spieler, who is my newest member 
over on Patreon. Thank you all very much for being here today. And if you want to have your name shouted out at the end of every single live stream and video on the channel, please make sure to check out the links in the description of ways that you can support me over on Patreon and Subscribestar as well. And it gives you access to things like giveaways of Blu-rays, 4Ks, and digital codes. Also, a uh, access to a podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger where we have a lot of fun. We also answer Q&A questions as well. And also you might get access to the Chosen of Valhalla level, which gives you access to a once a month podcast exclusively where I bring on you to the main channel with everyone else who is at the level. And we all just talk about movies, pop culture, and tons of fun stuff like that. And also, of course, Tina, who is the Empress of the Universe, is going to give us tons of reviews of movies and also maybe a couple of awesome rants here and there as well. So if that sounds fun to you, make sure you get, go ahead and check out those links. Again, you're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless.